clearly malaria case management and uh, but more in general the use of medicines uh, for also chemo prevention and we will see also the reuse for uh, transmission control especially when we use uh, primaquin so the next slide you can move uh, or it's frozen at the moment i don't see it moving okay so the, the uh, clinical aspects will be probably dominating our uh, course uh, and we will be together for uh, eight sessions as already you have been informed. When we do this uh, training by distance, uh, sometimes the audio or the video will not be very good. And sometimes it also because we are using many of us, the video function online. So we may have to sometimes, uh, if the connectivity is not very good, uh, to remove the video. And uh, so we just listen and we watch the screen and we certainly we can write using the chat box. Next slide. So in this presentation, I'm going to show you a set of slides and a short animation, mainly to check your connectivity. I want to ensure that uh, you hear very well. The quality of the image is nice. And uh, then you can use the chat box. So the, the contents will be relatively light. So this is the showing the natural history of malaria from a person which is non-infected up to the end of the infection, which is clearly death if it is falciparum malaria. And this is very difficult to study. It has a major problems because of again, ethical consideration. You cannot leave people infected without very close monitoring. Many of them will present the signs and symptoms and therefore there is a need to treat. So we still have a lot of the unknowns on the progression from the non-infected, infected people which become sick, very severe and finally die. So next you can click. And we have a lot of um, um, interventions that can help us to stop the progression. And you see from the very known preventive interventions like vector control or chemoprophylaxis that prevent a non-infected to become infected. But also we have uh, interesting and more and more the use of chemoprevention. So we can use medicines given in an intermittent basis to people which could be all the population, we call it mass drug administration, or we go into specific uh, targeted groups, it could be infants, pregnant women, or children under five. And we have different interventions which simply prevent uh, infection to become uh, symptomatic, to become a disease, and therefore to progress to severe illness and death. And then we have all the curative interventions, which are early diagnosis, appropriate treatment, referral of severe cases, and then the hospital-based management. And if these are implemented uh, well, it's possible to prevent mortality, even if transmission continues to be there. Next. Next slide. Now, the progression from uh, a very simple form of malaria could be very quick. And if you click again, even probably twice, you can see that the progression to more mortality or high case fatality rate is proportional to the time, to the delay that it takes to get early treatment and with an effective medicine. So one of the key determinants, but certainly not only, is that how prompt is effective give, uh, treatment given to symptomatic patients. And that's why uh, the interventions, the more they are close to the home, in the community, the more 
malaria can, um, mortality can be reduced. For uh, the patients which come to the hospital, there is a lot of studies which shows that uh, those which have been symptomatic for many days and maybe had uh, incomplete treatment or substandard treatment, uh, those are the ones which most likely are going to end very badly and probably die. Next. Now, the presentation of malaria is very different. Here you have a, an adult from Ethiopia in an area of highland malaria. It's uh, just to show you that in many places, adults can have a severe malaria. You also have a, a woman. This is a pregnant woman in India. She is uh, extremely at risk of severe malaria and many of the complications. And then if Lina, you click on the big photo of the child, you see that we have a little animation to show that often the children in areas of high transmission are the most vulnerable. They can develop fever, which is the most common manifestation, and quickly develop severe prostration so that they are unable to walk and sit without assistance. They may pro also have uh, alteration of the consciousness, which is one of the initial signs of uh, malaria, and also anemia, especially in children when they are subject to multiple infections in areas of high transmission. Now, the forms which are uh, with uh, cerebral manifestation evolve very often into stupor and coma. And very severe is the manifestation of acute respiratory distress, as it was quickly shown in the video. The, the children which develop acute respiratory distress and the cerebral malaria are the one most at risk of dying. And one of their manifestation here, which is the most, uh, let's say, visible, is the appearance of convulsions. The convulsions are uh, the one which often uh, can be quickly recognized by large uh, movements of one part of the body in a rhythmic way. But like in this child, uh, you will see that could be also very minimal twitching of the facial muscles, which could be difficult to, to detect and may require some specific attention. Now, the twitching, the different types of uh, corticate uh, rigidity, the specific movements are also things which create uh, very major concerns into the parents, the relatives, and often bring the child to uh, sometimes traditional healers first uh, and then to medical attention. Many of these children which have uh, the cerebral malaria forms uh, they may develop also some um, long-term complications uh, like uh, neurological disorders. Now, these are like 15, 20% of children with uh, cerebral malaria, but luckily in many of them, uh, uh, this will resolve uh, and they have permanent sequelae just in one or 2% of those affected. So next slide. This is a quick introduction about some of the points, but to be more specific, what we would like by the end of the course is clearly to have an update on malaria diagnosis and treatment with also the latest recommendation on use of diagnostics and new medicines. Some of them which are very close to be finally recommended by WHO, even if we don't find them yet on the WHO recommendation, but we will certainly go through them. We'll also look at difference in managing malaria case management at different levels of the healthcare system and uh, try to see how new evidence helps uh, to develop uh, policy updates. Because many of you work in the malaria program on case management issues, this will be very relevant to your daily work. We also would like to have uh, uh, your skills and uh, some practice around communication and presentation. Clearly, this will be through now the remote training approach. So you will have to give presentation yourself uh, via Zoom. 
And also we will give some assignments on how to train other participants. Sometimes we will create uh, like working groups uh, inside Zoom. So you will be like with six, seven colleagues and then working around some exercise. And if you become more and more using these tools, then yourself will be able to manage some training, uh, hopefully in person, because that's always better, but if not possible, also using these remote training facilities. So next slide. We will go through maybe a quick overview of the resources. Uh, we will have uh, certainly two or three presentations at each session, and those will be then put uh, on the OneDrive share folder so you can have them, you can use them, you can adapt. We will use the chat function and your hands up and interventions to discuss. We will have some little video to share and the case studies where again by individual or in groups, you will work on specific problems and many of them are clinical case studies. As we say, there, there will be some small group and practical sessions. We will use uh, as always this spot test, some quiz using Slido. And in these sessions, you will also start with the pretest. And this is really not to make any uh, assessment of your knowledge, but simply to monitor the progress with the post test, how much new uh, things have been. Uh, acquired and learned. And then certainly when we have the final evaluation. Now on the next, we have a, uh, in the OneDrive, uh, we will have uh, many resources. I don't know if you already tried it, but uh, the presentations of today are already up there. We will have uh, a series of uh, training resources and WHO documents to use. And uh, we will share uh, through this avenue also job aids uh, and other materials uh, that, that could be um, used uh, by yourself when you will do your training later on or if you want to refresh the uh, learnings from each session. Next presents uh, the contents. This uh, first introduction is uh, really to know each other and learn the methods of doing this remote training. And uh, after this, we will have an interesting, uh, I hope, uh, lecture on COVID and malaria, which I will give later. On the next week, uh, we will go into communication, teaching skills and chemo prevention. Then the third session will be mainly on diagnostics, uh, the what is currently the bedrock of malaria lab diagnosis. Four sessions we will go into details about the HRP2 gene deletions, which unfortunately are affecting in the Horn of Africa several other countries like uh, Eritrea, Djibouti, probably also part of Sudan, Northern Ethiopia, sorry not Sudan, I want to say Somalia. Um, so that's something that needs to be looked at in detail. We will have then a session five on uncomplicated malaria and the use of single low dose primaquine. On the next session on July 30, we will look into management of severe malaria and malaria in pregnancy. On the 6th August, uh, the anti-relapse treatment with Vivax and G6PD testing. And then on the last sessions, we will look into integrated management of febrile illness, both in health facilities and community. And we will look at that time, two months from now, what is new in the area of COVID and malaria, because uh, things are evolving very, very quickly. The recent data we have on both malaria and COVID-19, the impact that COVID-19 may have on malaria, what is expected. Uh, what do we know about the clinical presentation of uh, both and potential overlap that we definitely expect from the clinical point of view? And then what should be done in the community? Uh, what should be done for the lab and then for the treatment of uh, 
malaria in patients with COVID. And then a little bit last uh, mentioning about uh, where are we in terms of uh, maybe resource mobilization to uh, tackle all the issues and the needs at the moment. So this is a graph uh, of the malaria trend uh, that we have uh, developed just before the COVID uh, epidemic and it is in the World Malaria Report. And this is the malaria cases over time. And you see that in the last four years, there's been really not much progress on malaria. The situation has remained more or less the same. And uh, this is in spite uh, that uh, the all WHO member states, so all countries have uh, adopted the global technical strategy and they wanted and committed to actually reduce malaria significantly and, and to follow this green line, very um, ambitious target, like 40% uh, reduction by 2020 and 70% uh, by 2025, 90% by 2030. Now, the reality is that uh, we are going to miss totally the, even in the best scenario, the 2020 target. So we are not progressing as uh, originally many, many countries were uh, planning to do. And uh, this year, as we all know, there has been the COVID pandemic affecting a lot of the low middle income countries where there is a lot of malaria. And we are all concerned of the potential, not only lack of progress, but even malaria coming back and increasing because of COVID. So this is the familiar picture is on the WHO dashboard. It shows you with bubbles the cases and it's really massive. And every day we have more than 20,000 new cases, more than 20,000 new deaths. And the impact of COVID is huge, not only direct because of the COVID induced death, but the indirect mortality cause of COVID-19 and the economic consequence that is posing specifically in the most vulnerable population in a lot of the malaria endemic countries. So this is the data which was given as of 23 June, so very, very, let's say recent data. It doesn't show uh, going down, no stabilization. Actually, the numbers are going up. And there is a lot in the yellow bars is in the Americas where it's uh, all not only North America, but also the South American countries, Brazil, Mexico, we all follow. The numbers are huge. In EMRO, the situation is also increasing progressively. And uh, we have a, a progressive increase in Africa with a lot of problems related also of uh, reporting and testing and possibly getting more reliable data. Southeast Asia, especially because of uh, India, is also increasing progressively. And so this is in terms of the regions which are at the moment suffering most of the increases. Now, this is a, an interesting way of presenting the data, which is uh, by region, the malaria endemic countries, what is the change in number of COVID cases compared to the previous week. And um, this shows uh, uh, the bar, which are in red, this one already the numbers are 1% of the population. So it's a logarithmic scale. It means that some countries which are here in very low, this is for EMRO country, they, they still, they may, they may be increasing, but their number is still very low. Other countries which are on this side, they are increasing as well, but compared to the population, these are major increase. So in EMRO, here we're talking about Oman, Saudi Arabia, and um, maybe Djibouti, United Arab Emirates, uh, which are going up. And on a different level, the situation in Pakistan, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Egypt. And for some countries like Yemen, we definitely know there are issues on, so on the reporting and uh, which may 
again also confuse the, the true picture. So situation is evolving and countries are in a different state of um, suffering from the pandemic. Now, what is the impact uh, on the health services? This is the red line is the number of cases coming to the health facilities of COVID-19. And uh, this is, has happened in China, in Europe, in North America. They arrive in a way to almost uh, saturate the capacity of the uh, health system, especially intensive healthcare units. And this is when mortality starts to hit very high. And while COVID goes up, unfortunately, there is a temporary crowding out of essential services for other disease. In Europe, we have seen this a lot with the cardiovascular disorders. There has been very much decrease, and this is in natural because simply people are not going to the health facilities. The same we see in malaria countries. Many patients are staying at home. The reasons are maybe lockdown measures by the government. Sometimes it's fear and there is, uh, the, um, there is the feeling of uh, uh, this could give uh, some form of discrimination or just fear to be uh, uh, at getting the infection while going to the health facilities. But the problem is that uh, is not like elective surgery. If you don't go when you have malaria to health facilities, malaria, as we showed in the first presentation, will progress to severe illness and death. So there is no way this uh, malaria care could be postponed to later time. And people which don't get early diagnostic treatment are most likely going to die or have severe forms of illness. And this has been seen already with Ebola epidemics in Africa. The number of cases uh, dying for malaria was much higher than the cases of Ebola in many of the very highly affected countries. So this is what at the moment is major concern for uh, the malaria services. Now, how bad it could be this is an exercise which has been uh, published. The publication is available and I'll give you the link and the name. So modelers um, have looked at uh, malaria in Africa and they started to estimate what will happen in terms of uh, malaria mortality if there is uh, uh, no longer a distribution of LLIN. And what happens if when there is a reduction in care and treatment services by maybe 25% or 50% or 75%, what will happen to malaria? And what if we have all this together, both uh, uh, no longer distribution campaigns for bed nets and no longer access to health services? And the estimates are shown in this bar. If, if we have uh, basically disruption of malaria interventions, we can expect a massive increase in death. And in one year only, we could have in Africa an, an excess of 743,000 deaths, which is basically going back to the malaria situation in the early 2000s. And this is very interesting. There has been uh, some campaigns uh, of LLIN uh, postponed because of lockdown measures. Uh, there has been, uh, again, less utilization of the health facilities because of the change in treatment seeking behavior. Sometimes lockdown measure by the government has maybe affecting public transport has made it difficult for health workers to get to the health facilities and so they were not functioning. Or in other situations, the lack of PPE to protect health workers mean that the health workers also were themselves uh, not showing up into the health facilities. So if we continue with this analysis uh, and we look at what are the major determinants, uh, these are the different scenarios where you have uh, vector control or case management or both have been affected. And the massive increase in mortality is really when the early diagnosis and treatment is not functioning. 
So in order to prevent mortality in the context of the COVID pandemic, it is essential that the curative services from the community to the primary health care to the hospital level are still functioning and function very well. Now, the issue with COVID is that if we look at the, the signs and symptoms, this is come from the latest clinical management guidelines, which for COVID I, we put in the OneDrive share folder, so you have it. If we look at what is the initial presentation, there is a lot which is very similar to malaria, like fever. A lot of people present with fever or asthenia, anorexia, difficult breathing, myalgia, and cough. Even cough could be a presentation of malaria in children. And other things are also very unspecific, like sore throat, the nasal congestion, headache, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. All, all of these have been reported. And it's very clear that many of these, they overlap with other common causes of fever, like malaria or dengue or TB or bacterial pneumonia. So the clinician initially has to face a patient which could be malaria or could be COVID or also could be both infection together. And uh, once a patient is screened and meets a case definition of suspected COVID, they, the health facilities uh, are normally now organizing some uh, pathways uh, to manage this patient properly. They should be given a medical mask and then sent to a dedicated area in the health facilities with also some spatial separation between patients. And uh, at this time, when they are in the so-called COVID pathway, they should be assessed for possible co-infections. And uh, that means that uh, the health personnel, the lab technician, they all have to treat this patient as a suspected COVID and manage accordingly. Now, in the community, this could be very complex because at the moment we know that while in the health facilities, some organization and systems are being put up in the community, especially services by community health workers, are much more essential. And uh, there are some considerations, which again come from a very nice guidance that we've also shared with you in the OneDrive folder. There are some things which are quite good, like to hold the visit not within the house of the community workers, but to be possibly done outside to disinfect uh, the equipment after every visit, uh, look at respiratory hygiene, meaning when you're sneezing or coughing, how to do it, and maintain only the one meter distance. And then uh, if there are uh, some uh, symptoms like fever and fast breathing, and this, this, there is, uh, this is happening in an area where uh, there is suspected or confirmed COVID transmission, then the patient needs to be treated as a suspected COVID patient and potentially with a co-infection. And we have some guidance for ICCM, which has now been adapted for the COVID context. So let me go through this. This is, uh, the adaptation of the ICCM protocol for a place where there is a suspected transmission. And so the Ministry of Health has decided that a COVID measure needs to be implemented in this area. And for the individual patients, in case it is not suspected as COVID, so it doesn't meet those specific criteria for clinical manifestation or contact with a confirmed case, there should be, the measures are relatively minimal, but still there is a need to have the medical mask 
if doing RDT to have the gloves and use the modified distance if mask or gloves are not available. Now, if on the contrary, there is a suspicion of COVID, then the health workers needs to be equipped by what we call full the personal protective equipment. And if they do, then they certainly follow all the measures and they can test and treat the patient for malaria and then refer to a place where there is a proper investigation for COVID. But if these are not available, which is probably most of the situation in rural settings where we have community health workers, then they should basically maintain distance, do hand hygiene, not perform the malaria RDT, and then do the counting of respiratory rate from distance and also ask the caregiver to measure the mid upper arm circumference to check and check for edema. So the distance needs to be coming into. And if there is fever, this means suspected also malaria, then the treatment needs to be done on a presumptive basis. So this is for places where a patient could be suspected at COVID, there is no PPE available, no RDT is performed, treatment should be given on a presumptive treatment. So the patients, as we know, are different with COVID. Those which have mild to moderate illness, they uh, may not require hospitalization or emergency intervention. And where to follow them up really depends uh, on the setup uh, of uh, possible health facilities or community facilities, or in particular cases, do home care. But it's really exceptional. So I invite everybody to read the WHO guidelines on clinical management, because it's very clear in which settings this can be treated at home. It's very rare, actually, that somebody could just stay at home. And then if patients have severe pneumonia and they require oxygen therapy, definitely they are at risk of respiratory failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or even septic shock. They need to be hospitalized and according to the status, stay into the admission wards or progress into the emergency room. So all cases, in all cases, because of the overlap, whether it is a mild moderate illness or whether it is severe respiratory pneumonia, this patient needs to be tested for malaria, according if it is a malaria endemic area, TB, if there is TB and bacteria pneumonia, and dengue, if there is an ongoing also dengue transmission. Now, the, while they are, when we say in the COVID pathway, they need to be tested for uh, uh, the malaria. Uh, being positive for malaria does not exclude the COVID and vice versa, if they're positive with a COVID test does not exclude malaria. So in areas where there is a lot of malaria transmission, actually we expect uh, co-infection to occur. And um, the basic recommendation remains, use malaria validated rapid diagnostic test or do microscopy with thick and thin film. In terms of treatment, once the lab has been confirmed, the treatment for um, COVID infected patients with confirmed malaria infection, it is uh, following the WHO current recommendations with uh, artemisinin-based combination if it is uncomplicated malaria or parenteral artesonate if it is severe malaria. And uh, here we still do not know if uh, the two together, the two infection will aggravate uh, the fatality rate. However, we know that uh, both malaria and several other parasitic diseases can change the immune response 
We know that in malaria, there is a cytokine storm and a procoagulant state, which is very similar to what happened in severe COVID infection. And uh, we, everybody thinks uh, that uh, having both infection could be uh, resulting in a worse outcome. However, we can say that the clinical epidemiology of the co-infection is still not very much known and uh, is being collected through a series of clinical studies at the moment uh, in many sentinel hospitals across Africa. But we, and this, this is why I say, it, we should revisit this topic in two months uh, at the end uh, of this uh, training course. In terms of funding, uh, this is my last slide. I just want to say that uh, malaria funding has remained relatively stable over the last 10 years, with a lot of funding going to the high burden countries in Africa. A lot of this funding comes from the governments, maybe by one third approximately, but I would say that a lot still by some important funding agencies like the United States via Global Fund or via their bilateral programs. The good thing about Global Fund is that they have initiated a specific fund, which altogether is $1 billion, but part of it, it is for reallocation of unspent money, but there is a new money, a half a billion dollar, to buy especially PPE and other equipments that may serve to minimize the negative impact that COVID is having on HIV, TB, and malaria. So this is funding and there is an opening for accessing in terms of grant application. And I think this is uh, my last, uh, sorry. Uh, we put uh, all these resources on the OneDrive. You will have this presentation plus a series of uh, the guidance documents that most of them are very recent. And I really strongly encourage you to download and have a look. And this is my last one. So thank you for your attention.